All right, well, thank you very much. And it really is um, a great privilege and a real pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, Martin, thank you for those very nice words. Uh, and that's quite a difficult thing to try and do, to see whether we can take that very messy word of innovation. And that, as you say, we all want more of it, and we all like, and perhaps try and put some structure on our thinking. And Phil, thank you for being the person who interprets and helps uh, bridge that gap between an academic institution like MIT uh, and uh, the civil service. I think we have a lot to learn from each other, and so I'm also looking forward to learning a lot from this conversation. Uh, before I begin, I just want to say a little bit about the kinds of perspectives that I'm bringing to bear on this, which is really perspectives as a teacher, a researcher, and an advisor. So I've been a professor at MIT for a number of years, and I've been teaching in the area of innovation and entrepreneurship for about 15 years. And I teach everybody from our undergraduates all the way through to our mid-career executive MBA students. And so that's a fairly challenging audience. I'm not sure it's as challenging as this one, but it's certainly um, something that I think a lot about is what are the kinds of skills and tools and techniques that we can share with individuals to make it possible for them to do more innovation inside their various organizations. Uh, MIT is a university that's really well known for its sort of technological capabilities and its science. Uh, I lead the innovation initiative together with some of my colleagues in engineering, which is really meant to enable all of our community to be more effective uh, at innovation. As a researcher, I've spent a lot of time doing work that probably lies in what you might think of as the economics of innovation. How do we think about designing policies and programs that can be most effective to actually have more of this thing that we all think we want? And finally, I've had a chance to do some advisory work, uh, most importantly here in the UK, which I've particularly enjoyed, but also through our regional entrepreneurship acceleration program, where we work with regions all around the world, helping them think through how they might drive innovation-driven entrepreneurship. And so that has really forced me, I think, to think very hard about practical advice, as opposed to just sort of conceptual uh, ivory tower kind of advice. So I'm going to start with a few definitions, and I'm not sure that these are going to be the only definitions, and, and we can discuss whether we like them. Uh, these are definitions that at MIT we just find useful because these are complicated, messy words that everybody has a different view about. So we define innovation as actually a process, and it's the process of taking ideas from the earlier stages of inception all the way through to impact. And we use the word impact as opposed to profit because we recognize that you can have impact on the economy both in an economic sense and job creation, but also in a social sense, solving important social problems. Uh, by having a definition like that, we're well beyond just thinking about technology. As an institute of technology, we especially like gadgets, and we like anything techy, but we really do think about innovation as sort of new solutions that you can bring to bear to solve particularly difficult problems. And those solutions can be technical, but they could also be uh, different ways of delivering a particular service. They could be different business models. They can be uh, different models and modes of production. And so this is a quite broad definition, but at least by having that process-oriented definition, we can allow ourselves to think about where we're getting stuck in the entire innovation process. So we would argue, I think, that innovation can happen in a variety of organizational settings. It can happen in government. It can happen in not-for-profits, in large corporations. Entrepreneurship we think about as the collection of activities that are really involved in creating and growing new enterprises. And so that becomes one organizational context in which innovation can happen, but by no means the only one. So a lot of the work that we do at MIT is thinks about innovation and entrepreneurship, and we separate those two out because entrepreneurship is a particular organizational form. It's one that's very fashionable. It's incredibly popular among our students. We know it has some characteristics around risk-taking that we particularly like, but it's by no means the only place in the economy where innovation can happen. But what we do know is when we combine these two things together, this ability to create and develop these new-to-the-world ideas and really use them to solve problems with the entrepreneurial activity of new venture creation, that we can get the creation and growth of what we would think of as innovation-driven enterprises. And I think it's quite useful to make a distinction uh, between two quite different types of enterprises. Uh, SMEs, the small and medium-sized enterprises that we often think of as the lifeblood of many economies, and these more innovation-driven enterprises. I think that distinction is useful from a policy point of view, because the way in which we support these two types of businesses can often be rather different. Their needs are different, and frankly, their aspirations are different. Small businesses tend to be started with no particular aspiration to grow or to have any real competitive advantage. They're really there to create some amount of self-employment, to perhaps serve local needs. Whereas an innovation-driven enterprise is one that typically starts with an aspiration to have growth, 
uh, with something new to the world, or at least new to a particular region. And they have different capital requirements. Innovation-driven enterprises tend to require significantly more capital. They often have higher rate rates of failure, and they really do require different skills. So if I think about a range of companies that are innovation-driven enterprises, I might think of something like lastminute.com or Airbnb, Martin's already mentioned. I might think about iRobot or Arm, who have more technology and intellectual property, or a company like Oxford Biomedica. So you can really span that breadth of different types of uh, the innovation process. But those kinds of companies, I think, are ones that really require a particular kind of support uh, from government. And why might we focus on these kinds of enterprises? If you look at the data, both the US data, and we used to wonder whether this was a US-only phenomena, but in fact, I think the OECD data would suggest that the reason why these sorts of new-to-the-world enterprises and these innovation-driven enterprises are so important is because they're basically the source of much of the net job uh, growth in most developed world economies. So there's a lot of job losses from large corporations, although in the, in the sort of stock of jobs, they're extraordinarily important. It's really in these new high-growth businesses that we're seeing a lot of the new business uh, job growth. And so that's one of the reasons why economies all over the world really want more of these. There's also a multiplier effect. So in the new geography of jobs, Moretti talks about a Moretti multiplier, a multiplier that says every time you get one of these innovation-driven enterprises and a job in that sort of enterprise, you probably get about five more jobs in the small and medium-sized enterprises who are there to really support those other ones. So think of a place like Silicon Valley. Every time Google adds another employee, we probably need more dog-walking businesses and pizza businesses and dry cleaners and other delivery services to help support that part of the economy. And so whilst we make that distinction, those two types of businesses are really inextricably linked in the way our economies are growing and developing. Now, in a global economy, for a while, people told us that the world was flat and that, in fact, everything was sort of evenly distributed and communication would allow us all to do everything from everywhere. But at least in terms of innovation-driven enterprises and, frankly, in terms of innovation more broadly, there's a high level of concentration. And we see innovation-driven enterprises really being concentrated into regions that are often nowadays referred to as innovation ecosystems. So again, another buzzword to add to our collection, but certainly these quite concentrated geographic locations. This is just a map of startups founded by global cities. Basically, these companies are being created in places like the West Coast, in Silicon Valley, in London, and elsewhere in Europe, uh, in Singapore, Hong Kong, etc. So we know something about what makes these ecosystems effective. We know that they tend to be built on two very distinctive capacities. So again, to come back to that distinction between innovation and entrepreneurship, we know they're built in places that have both the capacity for innovation to bringing new to the world ideas to the fore, but also the capacity to be entrepreneurial, to really create new businesses that actually drive those innovations out into the economy to many customers uh, and so on. You can measure these in lots of different ways, and frankly, I think the measurement challenge can be really quite difficult. With innovation, we can think about measuring all the way along the continuum. We might start with publications or patents, but we really care about new product introductions. The same with entrepreneurship. We can think about new business starts, but we probably also care about the rate of growth of those companies, the job creation, IPOs, and other sorts of things. Not all regions around the world have this innovation capacity and entrepreneurial capacity really in the same quantities. So just, we were very simple and we just mapped entrepreneurial capacity on the horizontal and innovation on the vertical. You know, think about a place like Singapore, which is extraordinarily well known for its commitment to innovation and its real investment, uh, particularly in innovation based on science and technology. They're extremely powerful in that regard, but really have relatively little entrepreneurial capacity. By contrast, sort of on the bottom right-hand side, think of a country like India. Uh, we've had a chance recently to work with Thailand. Lots of entrepreneurship, lots of small business creation, but really very little innovation in those businesses, very little new-to-the-world ideas, new sorts of problems. There are a small number of places around the world uh, where they seem to have both. Israel would be a tremendous example, as startup nation, as it's sometimes referred to. But they really have both, and those two things are inextricably linked. We seem to find that these ecosystems tend to be most effectively built when they build upon a region's unique comparative advantage. So while Silicon Valley may be highly diversified across lots of industry sectors, most other innovation ecosystems around the world tend to be fairly specialized. If you think about a place like Boston, those of you who've been there and think about it from a biz sort of perspective or other points of view will know that it's really grounded in deep expertise in the life sciences, some in clean technology, hardware and robotics. 
a place like Israel, Tel Aviv, is really all about defense and cyber security. And that really is the foundation of its innovation ecosystem. Uh, somewhere like London is really built upon uh, digital uh, tech, uh, culture and media, and increasingly financial services and fintech is really being the sources of a lot of those uh, innovation-driven enterprises. And so there's something about specialization that I think is extremely important. And part of what we're trying to uh, teach regions and, and work with them on is to say, don't try and copy somebody else, but find your own unique comparative advantage and support that. We also find that innovation ecosystems are most effective when they engage all five of the major stakeholders in development and growth. So you might see that we put the entrepreneurs at the top and they're in a team. Uh, in this case, the graphic will show you that they're run by women. And the universities and risk capital are the most obvious and important part of this. But one of the things that we found in our work is that there's also an important role for government. Although, I mean, in some circles, this is quite a controversial statement to make, that the government does play a role, as do large corporations. If we ignore the large corporations and have them be entirely separate from this ecosystem, we're really not taking advantage of all the kinds of assets uh, an understanding of customers and problems that we might have. But everything I've described up to now are really heuristics. Right? So this is patterns that we see in trying to create simple heuristics. We've also been doing a lot of work developing what we call the science of innovation, which is really to say, not to say that there isn't an art to this, or to try and make innovation not a fun and interesting thing, or a moment of creative genius, but to rather say there are real patterns that you can study and analyze. And so we can build up systematic evidence of the sorts of factors that seem to impact the innovation process, both its rate and direction. Uh, certainly we can think about programs. Are certain programmatic interventions actually effective? Can we measure it? Do we know when something works or not? And what about policies? What are the specific kinds of policies that can really shape the direction of innovation? And can you really guide uh, innovation ecosystems in any way? We've worked with a lot of regions around the world in our REAP program, our Regional Entrepreneurship Acceleration Program, to share some of this and to try and build up the evidence. And we've been fortunate over the last two years to have a London team uh, with uh, considerable input from Biz and, and UKTI, with whom we've been working. But we've worked uh, with regions around the world on these questions. If we're going to have a science of innovation, we really need to have metrics to capture some of these activities. And so some of the work that my colleagues have been doing really focus on how we actually capture and measure innovation-driven enterprises. And how would we do that? If we take all the business starts, can we actually identify those that have the characteristics that are likely to lead to growth uh, and to job creation? And can we actually start to map them? And this is a map. Again, this is actually Massachusetts. And what you'll see is the vast... If we actually mapped all the startups and the new business starts across the whole state, we've colored in dark colors those that have the characteristics of high growth potential uh, with the sort of algorithms that we're using. And you'll see the dark ones are the ones that are over towards Boston. And if you, if you know the Boston area, what you'd be able to point to see here is that around Cambridge, around MIT and Harvard, over in Boston's innovation district, you see a very high concentration. So we start to be able to map this rather messy phenomena that we're really talking about. We also take time to think about program effectiveness. And so to ask the question, do programs actually like accelerators and other sorts of things that many governments and companies want, do they actually have a positive impact on firm growth? And how big is that impact? It turns out that's a pretty difficult question to answer empirically, because to separate out the selection effect that I've chosen some really good companies, so of course they grow from the treatment effect, the fact that I put them in my accelerator and I did something to them, quite a hard thing to do. And to do that, I really need to know something about the companies before and after they were with me. And I probably want to see the ones that got in and those that didn't, so I have a nice comparison group. You need a very friendly accelerator to help you do this, because of course, there's some chance that we might find that what their program has no effect whatsoever. And so it takes some courage to be willing to share data. Mass Challenge, which is effectively an MIT spin out, which I know is also based here in London, allowed us to use some of their data. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through the econometric apparatus that we use to do this. Suffice it to say, and perhaps I'm going to use the graph instead, that if I was to map along the bottom the scores from the judges of all the companies that got into Mass Challenge and those that didn't, you'll see there's a sort of a, a line at zero. The ones just below the line didn't quite make it in, and the ones above the line did. And what I've graphed on the uh, vertical axis is basically the, the amount of funding that they had in the 18 months after the program. And what you can see is that the companies that were in the program had experienced much greater levels of additional funding afterwards, and the same is true for their job growth. 
And so this begins to help us really tease out the fact that in this case, there really is an effect. And we can ask, how much did it cost to actually get these additional jobs? We also care about program design. So as many of you, I'm sure, are designing new programs, can you design them in a way that actually solves the problem that you want to solve? I've done quite a lot of work thinking about the bias and selecting and funding women-led businesses and asked the question, can we overcome this with program design that's effective? But we first needed to show that there was a bias. And so what we did is thought about, we were inspired by an experiment that's quite a famous experiment among social scientists that was uh, done with the Boston Symphony. It turned out that most violin players uh, were male. Um, and so a group of sociologists wanted to ask the symphony whether that was really subject to bias. And they said, no, they just make better violinists. So what they ended up doing, as you can see in the cartoon, is they put a screen between the player and the judge, rather like the voice. So you basically can't see the person singing or playing. And it turned out that, as you might expect, there was about a 50% increase in the number of women who were selected to be violinists. So we chose to be inspired by that and to basically do a similar design where we took entrepreneurial pitches and we, you could only see the slides and not the person delivering the pitch. And so we dubbed the voices with male and female voices and then used photographs that have been coded for attractiveness. And the title of the paper, which was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy, um, gives it away. Investors prefer entrepreneurial pitches, <coughs> pitched ventures pitched by attractive men. It turns out there's a very strong attractive man effect. Um, and uh, so what happens is if you actually just, all you see is a video of a pitch and you hear a male or a female voice and you see a more or less attractive photograph that goes with the gender, it turns out that people, if you ask them, is this convincing, is it investable, is it something you'd like to invest in, does this seem logical and rational, that in fact it's the male voice and the, vo and the image of an attractive man that's the most compelling. And what this shows you is that there's really clear evidence of bias in the system. So we then had a chance to work with Mass Challenge on how they design a selection process that would somehow overcome some of this. And it turns out that if you have a selection committee, particularly when this is all done in person, where you have at least two women on the selection panels, you can begin to actually get the bias out of the system. And so that's an important lesson for us, that program design can really help us. And just to end, um, we've obviously had the opportunity to bring some amount of this innovation science to the UK. Uh, we've worked quite closely with the folks at NASTA and the Innovation Growth Lab, myself and a number of my colleagues uh, serve on their advisory group. Uh, we've also had a chance through REIT to work with Team London, who you'll see here, who've designed a new growth builder program to basically work on supporting the growth of companies focused on shared expertise and support and a community for entrepreneurs to really encourage them to grow their businesses, not just start them. And we've really tried to help them design that program in a way that could allow for really serious evaluation. So we'd really know whether this program is effective. Uh, so it's really with that in mind of bringing some innovation science to this rather messy world of innovation and entrepreneurship that uh, I'm going to leave you with that thought. Thank you very much. Definitely.